told the story before. The last time I went to see Ajahn Sawat, he mentioned that his brain was sending him all sorts of strange perceptions. And that basically was one of the differences between him and my father. When my father approached death, he had suffering from Parkinson's, and then it developed into Parkinson's dementia. In my father's case, he couldn't tell that the, his brain was sending him strange perceptions. He believed them. He was in them. If he saw a black dog coming into the living room, there was a black dog in the living room. No two ways about it. That people were committing suicide outside. It was, there were people committing suicide outside. That's what he saw. That's what he sensed. Because he sensed it, that's the way it was. With the John Sawat, he trained his mind to step back from his thoughts, to step back from his thought worlds. And that's what saved him from a lot of suffering. This is one of the reasons why we develop mindfulness, why we practice concentration. The mindfulness to keep in mind that sometimes our perceptions are off. And the concentration gives us a place to step back so we can examine them, to watch the perception as it comes, to watch it as it goes, and to ask ourselves which, which of our different sets of colored glasses that we've been wearing. The greed glasses, the ill will glasses, the drowsiness glasses. Restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty, all these are different glasses that we can wear at any one time. They distort our vision, and then starting from distorted visions, we act in distorted ways and end up suffering because of the distortion. The canon describes the different hindrances as different kinds of water. Sensual desire is water with dye in it. In other words, you see something as desirable, and the object is just there, neither desirable nor not desirable. But as soon as it's tinged with that sense of desirability, it looks glamorous, it looks enticing. That's how it's colored. Ill will is like boiling water. You can't see anything clearly at all. If you try to look at your reflection in boiling water, it's all scattered and broken up. Sloth and drowsiness is like water that's been covered with algae. Restlessness and anxiety is water with the wind blowing over it, and uncertainty is water kept in a dark place. None of these forms of water are good for looking at your face, and they're not good for looking at anything at all, because they distort what you see through them. This is why we need concentration as a place to step back, so we're not caught up in what we thought we saw. Well, we actually saw it, but then it was seen through distorted glasses through reflected in water that really can't give a true reflection. So this is one of the reasons why we develop concentration. It's a safe place to stay. And your mind is not clouded or obscured by any of these hindrances. You've got a better chance of looking at that process of perception that told you that this thing was desirable, that person was someone you really want to see suffer, so on down the line. There's no guarantee, of course, that concentration will give you 100 percent true vision of everything. Even the insights you gain from concentration have to be tested. But you're in a much better position when your mind is still. And when you have this as a place you can tap into at any time. Even people 
practicing advanced stages of concentration they have to use this as a place where they step back from whatever insights arise. There's a story of Ajahn Mahabhua thinking about the teachings he learned from Ajahn Mun. Ajahn Mun had passed away and he felt lost, bereft of a teacher. He said he was like an animal who had been depending on a doctor and now there's no doctor for him. Now he's going to be a wild animal in the forest with no doctor to look after him at all. But then he realized, well, what was it that Ajahn Mun taught? Take that as your teacher in his absence. And one of the lessons that came to him at that point was whatever comes up in the mind that you're not 100% sure about, just stay with a sense of the knower, just basic awareness. And whatever that knowledge is, it'll pass. And in its passing, you gain a sense of how reliable it may have been. Or at the very least, you're safe. Because there are a lot of things that can come up in the practice that can be dangerous. We think about the Buddha and the night of his awakening. Those first two knowledges were dangerous. Knowledge of his previous lifetimes. He could have gotten all absorbed in the fact that now he suddenly knew something he hadn't known before. He had seen a truth that death is not the end. That one life leads to another, to another, to another. And there are stories in the canon of people who gain this much insight and they set themselves up as teachers. But the Buddha's question was, what was the, what's the best use to make of this kind of knowledge? And what other questions arise on seeing this kind of knowledge? And one of the questions that occurred to him was, does this happen only to me? And what's the pattern behind all this moving around from one birth to the next to the next? And so in the second knowledge of the night, he saw beings of the world say, falling and reappearing is the technical term, dying and being reborn, taking rebirth. And again, he could have fallen for this knowledge. I know of people in Thailand who've gained knowledge of this sort, and they set themselves up as fortune tellers. They go around giving advice to people whose relatives have just died. And what usually happens is that kind of knowledge begins to deteriorate. And here they are, they've set themselves up in this business, and all of a sudden the, the source of their knowledge has disappeared. And it's very few people who are honest enough to stop doing this. Most people just start going with whatever impulse comes in the mind, whatever picture comes in the mind, that it must be true. But the Buddha saw that that was not the best use of that knowledge. Because the important knowledge of seeing beings dying, being reborn, was what determines the good rebirth, what determines unfortunate rebirth. And so it was their actions, the extent to which, <clears throat> the extent to which they listen to noble persons, develop right view, and acted on right view. So that inspired him with a further question: well, What's the best use of this knowledge? And that second knowledge pointed to intention as the important factor that determines what happens to people. What if you looked at your intention in the present moment and developed the kind of view that would allow you to put an end to all of this, dying and being reborn? So these are some of the questions that the Buddha asked. And these are the questions that kept him from falling into the dangers of those different kinds of knowledges. So as you can see, there are dangers all along the path, starting with your hindrances and your really gross defilements. And then you get the mind concentrated so you can pull out of the gross defilements, the hindrances, and then you find you've got these other problems that come up. But if you keep this basic principle in mind, one, find a still place to just watch these things coming and going. And then to ask yourself, what's the best use of this knowledge? Because even if you don't attain psychic powers through the meditation, there's still a lot of 
false assumptions that you can fall into as the mind reaches deeper and deeper levels of concentration. You start experiencing the infinity of space and the infinity of consciousness. It's very easy to come to the conclusion that you've reached the ground of being, that you've hit some metaphysical absolute. And so this is where the Buddha's questions are important. Okay, what are you doing to experience this? Then you make the mind very quiet and you watch to see what exactly the doing is, because only when things are very, very still can you see these subtle levels of action in the mind. You know, see whatever comes up as a kind of fabrication. And so you try to put yourself in the stillest spot possible to sense that kind of fabrication and keep that question in mind. What are you doing here that maintains this? Sometimes you hear the teaching that as you meditate you shouldn't do anything, you should just be. Well, the being is getting into concentration. The doing that most people are involved in is doing involved with the hindrances, doing involved with the different defilements. And so you learn to just be in the concentration. Just be one with the breath. Be one with the sense of space and be one with the awareness. Be the knowing. But that's a state of becoming. And it's a skillful state of becoming. It's necessary as part of the practice. But you don't want to fall for the assumptions that go along with that state of becoming. You want to learn to be able to step back from those as well. So developing the stillness of the observer that holds that question in mind. What's going on here? I'm not fully believing the assumptions that you're taking on. That's what enables you to get past the pitfalls of the practice. So it's the same principle all the way through, but it's easy to forget. You get past the hindrances, and at last you arrive at concentration. And you may believe, ah, oh, this is it. Finally in touch with my true nature that I can trust. The Buddha says, no, you've got to watch that as well. That assumption about true nature, assumption about just being instead of doing. Those assumptions can obscure a lot of things. So that initial awareness that it tells you not to trust everything that the mind tells you. You start with obvious defilements, and sometimes they're not so obvious for everybody. It's a question of learning to see things that should be obvious but haven't been. Something's been obscuring them. It's like those old Zen stories. You stand outside the Zen story, and of course what the teacher has to say is true. And of course the student should have understood that. But the student was in the situation, buried in the defilement, which meant that he couldn't see. And the teacher had to shock him out of that state to let him see what was going on. Well, in this case, you learn to use the concentration as the place where you get out of whatever your defilement is. If you have to depend on a Zen master to hit you every time you had a defilement, you're never going to get anywhere in your practice. You have to learn how to whack yourself upside the head. In other words, catch yourself in the course of falling into something unskillful and asking, is this really where you want to go? Because a good part of the mind is going to say, yes, this is what I want. This is why I was seeing things in this way to begin with. I wanted desire. I wanted ill will. You've got to have the mindfulness and concentration and discernment to resist that, pull out of it, question it. And then when you've learned how to depend on your concentration, you have to realize, okay, there's some subtle things in here that you've got to question as well. So it's this ability to place a question mark next to things and having the, the skills needed to watch, to learn how to answer that question mark, 
It's an essential part of the path. Because everything the Buddha teaches is about doing. It's the language that you need to master the skills. It's not just sitting around and figuring out what, what's the greatest concept. Would a great concept be dualism? Or would a greater concept be non-dualism? Or how about thinking about going beyond concepts? For the Buddha, it wasn't just abstract thinking. You know, things like infinite space, infinite consciousness sound like abstractions, but they're actually labels that you apply as you're developing your skills. The labels that are needed to get you to particular states of mind. So keep on reminding yourself that whatever they're, the vocabulary here, it's a vocabulary of someone who's learning a skill. In the same way that, say, you're learning how to play the violin, there's, there's the spun sound, there's the dark sound. You learn the vocabulary so you can create the qualities of sound that you're looking for. You are learning the vocabulary of the Buddha's teachings as part of the skills that we're supposed to master. It's only when you've mastered the skills that you can put the words down. You can think about the idea. Okay, we get to a level of abstraction and say, okay, let's just go beyond the abstraction, beyond the duality, beyond the conceptualizing. That must be a higher thing. Conceptually, it may sound nice, but it has, if it has very little to do with what you're actually doing in your mind, it's all a distraction. You want to be able to question where the mind is right now. And then when you use whatever level of vocabulary is appropriate for where you are right now. If you're having trouble getting the mind concentrated, you're going to be interested in the hindrances. Once it's concentrated, you're going to be interested in navigating the different levels of concentration. And then you're going to be more interested in learning how to navigate the the subtle defilements that build up around concentration. But in every case, it's a matter of learning how to get the mind as still as possible and watch with that little question mark in the background, so you don't fall for these things. So the mind becomes its own best friend. <laughs>